All right, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Charles Elkin. Oh, you've got a dongle. Oh, uh, I'd like to thank Wendy for inviting me to give this talk. <laughs> and, you know, um, it seems that um, uh, every day I hear talks at a conference nowadays, the speaker before lunch makes the joke about being the only thing between the audience and lunch. And I'm the only thing between you and the break, and so my talk is only going to be half as long as the previous ones. Okay, let's. I'm sorry? I'm not getting any computer signal from you. Um, right, let me figure that out. Okay, it's doing detect displays. Okay. Um. All right. Okay, good. So I'm going to be talking about a, a pretty specific topic. How can we train a classifier if we don't have positive and negative examples, we just have labeled positive examples and then we have unlabeled examples. And this is a problem that uh, people have come across uh, over at least the past 10 years uh, in several different application areas of machine learning and of course, people have come across similar problems in statistics also. Um, my first slide, actually I wrote this independently of uh, Burr's first slides, but we have the same reference, um, uh, a survey paper from uh, nucleic acids research that was published in January of this year, uh, which uh, referred to a database of databases with uh, 1,380 separate specialized databases in molecular biology. And so that's bioinformatics, and I think there are similar issues in medical informatics um, uh, that um, uh, there's uh, too many databases that need updating. So typically, these molecular biology databases, they have human curators who are reading the literature and uh, finding relevant papers and extracting information from those papers. So the research question for us is how can software be helpful in updating databases. Of course, ideally we'd have a fully automated pipeline, but that's not going to happen in the near future. And um, a big part of the pipeline is information extraction, and an important part of the pipeline also is text classification. And my talk today is going to be about the text classification part of the pipeline. Um, as uh, an illustration of the need, this is a chart from a few years ago about um, uh, Swiss Prot, um, which actually has a highly curated subset and then a much larger, less highly curated subset. But both um, have been growing exponentially, and uh, so this is not scalable in terms of human effort. Um, an interesting thing that um, uh, it may be that the published literature actually grew exponentially until 2009, and since and in 2009 peaked, and since then has stayed roughly stable. And um, uh, if that's true, then that's uh, quite understandable in terms of funding levels and human effort levels. But um, uh, the availability of sequence data has not at all peaked, especially because of metagenomics. So going out and just sequencing. Uh, whatever you can find in environmental samples, whether it's from the human digestive system or from the ocean. So sequence data has not at all peaked, and so we certainly need automated ways of um, uh, dealing with sequence data. Uh, the research that um, uh, I've done in this area over the past few years uh, was motivated by a database that's here at UCSD called TCDB. So this is one of these 1,380 databases. Um, we like to believe that it's one of the more important one of, of these over 1,000 databases. And um, uh, you know, many of you may have heard of um, the enzyme classification system, EC, which is a standard for classifying uh, proteins that catalyze reactions. And um, another big category of proteins are proteins that go in the cell membrane and that um, uh, transport small molecules in and out of the cell. And these are called transport proteins. And um, in fact, there is an international standard for organizing um, uh, everything that's known about transport proteins, which is called TC for transport classification. Um, the principal investigator on that is Milton Sayer, who's a colleague here at UCSD. Uh, Milton and I um, have an NIH grant which um, has been renewed um, uh, for um, uh, 
updating and maintaining TCDB, which is the repository of information on membrane transport proteins. And so we have the um, uh, classic issue of needing tools to help with updating this database. Um, our pipeline is uh, nothing surprising about it. We want to identify relevant papers or proteins. Uh, we find information in the literature. When I say we, I, should, I really mean Milton and people in his lab. Um, find relevant papers in the literature or find proteins which are in other databases which um, should be in TCDB also. And then the important stage of the pipeline is to eliminate papers or proteins that for one of several reasons uh, should not be included in TCDB. TCDB is supposed to be a repository of reliable information, so there should be experimental evidence that supports um, uh, whatever is recorded in the database. And if you have proteins from different species, so they're homologs, but so they have the same structure and they transport the same substrates, then TCDB is not supposed to be uh, comprehensive in that way. So um, it may well be that a paper or a protein is relevant, but needs to be eliminated from the pipeline. And then information has to be entered into TCDB. A TC number is assigned, which um, classifies the function of the protein, and relevant information has to be transferred. And um, a lot of the problems here are classifier learning. So identifying relevant papers, that's, or protein, that's classifier learning. Um, uh, and then um, uh, we want to recognize, um, does a paper or a section in a paper or a paragraph uh, describe experimental evidence, or does it merely describe um, the results of sequence analysis, say? Uh, and um, then for transferring relevant information, um, we're not foreseeably going to be at the point when information is transferred fully automatically, but identifying relevant sections and paragraphs of papers is certainly a classifier learning problem. And interestingly, if we have um, information that is not in papers but is in other databases, then that looks a lot like a text classification problem also because um, uh, these database records from other databases, most of the fields are semi-structured or textual. And so we're not going to be able to do simply database queries to transfer information from one database to another. This is an example of an entry in uh, SwissProt. Um, we did, um, uh, a few years ago, um, uh, asked the question, well, do we really need to learn classifiers, or would it be better to have human experts who design handcrafted queries for finding, in particular, we were looking at finding proteins in SwissPro that were transport proteins that should be in TCDB. Um, uh, TCDB has um, uh, pretty much caught up with the literature and other databases now, but a few years ago there was a period when it was behind. And so we had some human experts who tried to um, uh, construct queries by hand. And um, uh, so some queries used uh, gene ontology, GO, which um, is a, uh, <coughs> one of the accepted sources of um, uh, really uh, formal information about proteins. And uh, the best that uh, we could do with that was 68% precision, 74% recall. And then also we tried um, uh, with human experts constructing queries using keywords um, directly on the text of the other database records. Best we could do was 78% precision, 72% recall. And it seems that there are some fundamental reasons why um, uh, handcrafted queries can't get very high precision in recall. One is that the handcrafted keyword lists are always uh, incomplete. Um, uh, I think um, the, the previous speaker mentioned um, uh, an example of Oscar being a relevant word, which might not have occurred to a human. And so you really need data to um, uh, uh, find a comprehensive list of relevant keywords. And then, of course, you know, humans are not good at dealing with very large lists of keywords. And relevance depends on the relationships between entities. So I mentioned that. Um, uh, we don't want a protein in TCDB, for example, if there isn't sufficient experimental evidence. So if we were really trying to classify 
whether or not a particular um, uh, protein should be included in TCDB. Um, you know, to really make, the way the human would make the decision would be actually reading the text and describing the um, justification for the information and then, you know, is that experimental justification and does that experimental justification actually apply to this particular protein or maybe it applies to some different protein which is also being discussed in the paper. Um, uh, and so, you know, an, an ideal pipeline would actually um, have a loop with um, classification to find relevant information, information extraction to um, annotate that information, and then based on the annotation, inferring relationships, and then feeding those relationships back to the classifier to get more accurate classifications on. Of course, we're not at that uh, stage yet, but um, uh, by using um, uh, machine-generated classifiers, um, uh, if there are words which are at least correlated with the relationships that are important to classification, then the machine-generated classifiers can indirectly pick up some of these relationships. And so then, uh, I'm a computer scientist, so uh, one question I was asking was, well, we could do all this work software development, but we'd also like to see, are there any um, uh, interesting theoretical questions here that uh, and its fundamental theoretical question is that we don't have negative training examples. So in TCDB, for example, you know, every protein in TCDB is a positive training example. But then if I go to my colleagues, the biologists, and I say, well, you know, give me examples of proteins that aren't transport proteins. And you know, first of all, it's, it's never occurred to them to think of that question, to think of negative examples, and then they give an answer, well, you know, but everything in Swiss Prot. But then the whole point is to go to Swiss Prot and to find things that are in Swiss Prot that should be in TCDB but aren't in TCDB. So in fact, the entries in Swiss Prot that aren't in TCDB are not negative examples, they're unlabeled examples. Most of them are negative, but we don't know which ones are negative, and a fraction of them are positives, and those are the ones we want to detect. Uh, so we just don't have definite negative examples for training. And uh, then uh, it turns out that this problem has certainly been addressed in previous research, but um, hasn't been formalized, at least not in the way that we formalize it. And we like to think about things uh, probabilistically, um, but um, elementarily. So uh, here's a very elementary probabilistic formalization of the problem. So we have examples, and call an example X. And then examples have labels. These could be training examples or test examples. And zero means negative, one means positive, and here we'll think of the positive as being relevant, and almost always we have an unbalanced classification problem, and so we think of the positive class as being the rare class, but almost always the rare class is the interesting class. And so our goal is to learn a classifier, um, but we're not just interested in a classifier that will give a yes-no label to test examples, we really want to know confidence and certainty. So we want a probabilistic classifier. So we want to learn a function f, which we can apply to any example x, and then f of x ideally will be the probability that the example x is positive. So probability of y equals 1 given x. And then um, uh, to uh, address the particular issue that we have labeled positive examples, but we don't have labeled negative examples, we'll introduce another random variable which we'll call S. S is short for selected, and uh, to indicate whether or not an example is labeled. So if the label of X is available, we say the random variable S equals one. Otherwise, random variable S equals zero. And our scenario is that only positive examples are labeled. Negative examples uh, never labeled. So the probability that S equals one, given Y equals zero, is zero. And this is true for any X. So probability of S equals one given X and Y equals zero is zero. This is the formal statement that negative examples are not labeled. And then to make progress, we need to make an assumption 
which uh, I call the selected completely at random assumption. Uh, for uh, some people here may be familiar with the analysis of missing data due to Little and Rubin, and the simplest case of missing data is missing completely at random, and this is an analogous assumption, selected completely at random. So the assumption is that the probability that a positive example is, has a known label is the same regardless of what that particular example is. So the probability that s equals 1 given x and y equals 1 is probability of s equals 1 given y equals 1, which is a constant c. So being labeled obviously depends on being positive or negative, but it doesn't further depend on the specific nature of the example x. So that's, this is the selected completely a random assumption. It's a strong assumption, but to make any progress, we need to make an assumption. And so then um, uh, for learning, we have a training set. And the training set has labeled examples and unlabeled examples. So for each example in the training set, we know it's feature vector x, and we know s equals 1 or s equals 0. And then we can apply our favorite learning method, and we get back a classifier. But what this classifier is predicting is not the probability of being positive. It's predicting the probability of being labeled. And so we call this a non-traditional classifier. There are um, uh, some implicit assumptions that are even more fundamental than the assumption for being selected completely at random. And these assumptions are really uh, implicit in using a probabilistic approach to classification. So it's important to understand that feature vectors x are not deterministically labeled. Um, uh, so even though um, each instance, say each uh, article in the literature, it might be either positive or negative. We are assuming that it's either positive or negative. However, when we have an instance, we represent it by a feature vector. And that feature vector may lose information. And so you could have two different instances, at least in principle, which are represented by the same feature vector. And one of those instances might be positive and the other instance might be negative. And so in that case, the feature vector is not deterministically positive or negative. It's only probabilistically, it's positive with a certain probability, negative with a certain probability. And that's the um, uh, situation that we're in. And um, uh, so even though we're assuming that the probability of being labeled, so the probability of s equals 1 is, it's a constant 0 for negative examples, and it's a constant c for positive examples, it doesn't follow that the probability of being labeled is constant for every x, because the probability of being positive is not the same for every x. So, um, uh, you know, <clears throat> given that understanding of the situation and given the assumption for selected completely at random, we can prove a lemma. And the lemma is actually uh, very simple. Um, the proof is right here, and you could probably even shorten the proof even more. Um, so in a sense, the lemma is restating what the situation is. And so the contribution here compared to previous work is to formalize the situation and to make the assumptions explicit. So the, the result of the lemma is that the probability of being positive is actually the probability of being labeled divided by the constant C. And C is the probability of being labeled for a positive example. So uh, this is really a rephrasing of uh, Bayes' rule. Um, uh, and so the, the immediate application of the lemma is that we can train our non-traditional classifier. So that's what we can do directly from the available data. And then because of the assumption, we can actually um, uh, get the classifier we want um, uh, by estimating the constant c and then dividing. Um, in fact, in the paper where um, uh, we presented this, we also gave various other approaches for using the lemma for getting a, a classifier, but this would be the uh, simplest. 
Now, um, estimating C is, um, uh, it, it's, it's not obvious what the best way is to estimate C, and in fact, um, uh, it's not obvious that it's possible to estimate C, and you may need to make some additional assumptions to estimate C. But what we found to be the um, uh, best approach for estimating C is, um, uh, okay, so we train our non-traditional classifier, which estimates the probability of being labeled. And remember, the, the, sort of, the maximum probability of being labeled is C. That's the probability of being labeled for an example which, is, which has a probability one of being positive. So actually, we um, uh, use an extended version of logistic regression. So standard logistic regression is a classifier that gives you well-calibrated probabilities, but um, uh, it can give probabilities that range from zero to one. And so if you train a logistic regression classifier on any data set, then um, there will be some test example which has a probability arbitrarily close to one and some test example which has a probability arbitrarily close to zero. And in fact, um, uh, we, that, that's not a um, uh, reasonable assumption in this case. We want the maximum possible probability to be this constant C. So we modify the logistic regression model to introduce a ceiling so the um, uh, parameter B determines the ceiling, and then we can train the modified logistic regression, and from that we can just read out what the ceiling value is. And so that's our estimate of C. And we um, uh, train by gradient descent, um, and B is just um, this interesting additional parameter. Okay, so um, I'll show one concrete application. So our positive set was uh, <clears throat> over 2,000 records from TCDB. The unlabeled set that we used for experiments was twice the number of records from SwissProt. And um, you know, if we were applying this, we would just have the positive examples, we would have the unlabeled examples. But we want to measure the success of our methods for learning without negative examples. So in order to do that, we separately went in and hand annotated the examples in the unlabeled set U to find which were the actual true positives within U. So we call that set Q. And in a real application, Q would be unknown. And there were 348 of those um, hidden positives within the unlabeled set. Then we compared four methods. So the gold standard method would be using the real positives versus the real negatives. So the real positives are P union Q, and the real negatives are U minus Q. Um, and then we have two methods that are based on the lemma. And then um, uh, looking at the literature, the um, uh, best previously suggested method uh, is a heuristic method called the biased support vector machine method from Bing Liu and his colleagues. And to make the comparisons um, fair, we implemented each method using linear support vector machines and with thorough search for good hyperparameters. So linear support vector machines, when you regularize them correctly, are a state-of-the-art method for text classification. And we didn't want one method to come out better simply because it was using better basic classifier. And when needed, so that's for our methods two and three, we did post-processing to get calibrated probabilities. And here are the ROC curves for the four methods. And uh, perhaps the bottom line is that, is that there isn't a huge difference between the methods. Um, uh, the uh, black line, which is the best line, is the gold standard method. And then the um, uh, purple line, which is the lowest line, is the biased SVM method. And then the two lines in the middle are the two versions of our method using the lemma. And they get you about halfway from the best previous method to the gold standard. Of course, this is just one experimental case. There's no guarantees that um, uh, you'll get a similar ranking of the methods on a different application. Uh, and this is um, just a zoom in on the most interesting part of the ROC curve. So, Overall, the um, ROC curves, if you zoomed out, the ROC curves would look pretty similar. But there is a clear difference. Uh, 
these are the numerical results, and um, uh, so um, uh, our um, second method proposed in this particular paper that's based on a lemma is slightly better on all the measures of performance. And then maybe the last column is the most interesting one because um, uh, you know, our methods are based on learning a classifier that distinguishes the labeled from the unlabeled and then doing a transformation. So that's uh, very fast. You just have to learn one classifier. And the biased SVM method is based on um, uh, almost a brute force search of training many, many different subal vector machines and then um, having a heuristic way of guessing which one is going to do best. And so the relative time, the biased SVM requires training 621 classifiers compared to just training one or two classifiers for our method. Um, so uh, this method, um, uh, we published it in 2008 in the KDD conference, and um, people have noticed it. And so um, uh, uh, some colleagues at the University of California at Merced uh, wanted to apply it to um, ecological data sets. So the situation here is that you want to model where you expect to find a particular species, say some sort of owl. And you have positive observations of, you know, the owl was living in this tree in this location. But you don't really have negative observations because maybe the owl was living in this other tree and you just failed to see it. Um, or the observations come from, often come from museum records from, could be many decades, even 100 years ago. And there are no museum records about species being absent. There are only museum records about species being present. So um, uh, that's the title of the paper. Can we model the probability of presence of species without absence data? Um, uh, okay, yeah, so application in uh, bioinformatics, so gene regulatory networks are uh, of great interest these days. And um, uh, Luigi Cerullo and Michele Ceccarelli, uh, colleagues in Italy who were um, interested in um, <clears throat> estimating gene networks as accurately as possible when essentially you only, you have positive information about this gene or this um, uh, protein does regulate this other gene, but um, it's much harder experimentally to obtain the negative data that clearly this protein does not regulate this gene. So this was a paper in BMC Bioinformatics uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so uh, I think this is my last slide. Um, uh, I want to, um, uh, so, so the very simple take home message is that what you were going to do naively actually is sensible. Um, because if you're not interested in estimating probabilities of being positive, but you're just interested in ranking so that the more likely to be positive are at the top of the list and the less likely at the bottom, then you can just train a classifier that discriminates between the labeled and unlabeled and then the probability of being positive will give the same ranking as the probability of being labeled. But there is a critical assumption here, so the negative thing to point out in the discussion is that the selected completely at random assumption says that every positive instance is equally likely to be labeled. And there's really two things wrong with this assumption. The first is that it may not be true, and the second is that even if it's true, how can you use data to verify it? You know, if we make an assumption, we'd like to be able to look at data and somehow figure out that the data confirm the assumption. So I think um, these are two open questions, how to relax the assumption, how to verify the assumption. And uh, if you just think about the example of um, uh, species presence information. So um, uh, you get your information from a museum. The museum has the records from the expedition of some explorer well, the explorer went up the river. And so if the species was living near the river, the explorer was much more likely to observe it than if the species was living far away from the river. So the probability of being labeled for a positive is not constant. The probability of being labeled depends on covariates like distance from the river. And I actually think that it's possible to um, extend the analysis to account for a non-constant probability of being labeled, uh, but that would be future work. Okay, I'll stop here, thank you. <laughs>
Oh, yeah, these are the references. Question? Yeah. Um, I noticed that in your experiment of the TCDB, uh, you have uh, twice as many as the negative instance yeah. versus the positive. I just wonder if you have any insight regarding the size of the positive versus the negative impacting the uh, results. For um, instance, you have a very small set of a positive, and then you have a tens or even hundred okay. thousands of large as a larger set of the negatives. Yeah. So um, uh, certainly, intuitively, the um, uh, uh, in, in, intuitively the higher the proportion of positives in the unlabeled and the higher the number of training labeled positive examples, those should both make the problem easier. And in this particular experiment, we um, uh, took a certain number of negatives. We took, we took, sorry, we, we took more unlabeled than positives because that's the realistic situation. But we only took 4,900 unlabeled because we only had the resources to go and find the real positives within that number of unlabeled. So I think the, you would expect the performance of any method to do worse the more unlabeled you have and the fewer positives you have. But um, uh, I wouldn't expect our method to degrade more quickly than other methods. Uh, Susan? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. That was an extremely interesting talk addressing a very urgent problem, actually. I I'm curious if there's any way to change the model to also include, as you start to label things, if, 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 in, could you inject a small number of labeled negative examples, and what would that do to, to the model mm -hmm. or the, the mm -hmm. method? Um, we haven't thought directly about that, so I don't have an answer to that question. Um, uh, one thing that I would mention is that, um, uh, you know, supposing that you um, uh, go into your unlabeled and you find some positives within your unlabeled and then you put them back in your positive training set, I think then you run a strong risk of uh, violating the assumption even more. And so then there could be a, um, uh, so that, that could possibly be a reason, a downside to putting additional positives into your, um, uh, into your positive training subset. But I think that um, uh, still needs to be investigated mathematically and experimentally. We were in a situation where we already had a lot of positive examples because those were the records already in the database. And in fact, for text classification, we also already had a lot of positive examples because each protein that's already in the database is annotated with the papers that its information came from. All right, thanks again. Thank you.